There are three reasons, well, I came up with three reasons, why you might smile when reading the book of Esther. First, as you go through the story, you can see the humor, the political satire that's built into the story. I call it the Persian bee. The second reason you, you would smile reading Esther is you might not have any idea what's going on. People do that, you know, when they don't know what you said or what's going on. They just, they just smile, and it's a nice thing to do. But there are parts that are a little hard to figure out. And the third reason why you might smile reading Esther is, as Thomas Paine said, the real man smiles in trouble. The real woman smiles in trouble, gathers strength from distress, and grows brave by reflection. Well, we see that in this book. We see the the bravery, the growth of Esther and Mordecai in the face of a coming Jewish holocaust. And it does give us something to smile about. We love these stories of courage. And we come to chapter 6 today. We've arrived at the turning point in Esther And in chapter 6, gives us a lot to smile about. It happens to be one of the most humorous chapters in the Bible. So the title today is Sleepless in Susa. We'll be looking at Esther chapter 6. There's three parts. First, the sleeplessness of Xerxes, the king, verses 1 to 5. Then the exaltation of Mordecai the Jew, verses 6 to 12, and then the humiliation of Haman, verses 12 to 14. So let's read the Word of God. Esther 6, verse 1. That night the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of the history of his reign so it could be read to him. That'll put you to sleep. In those records, he discovered an account how Mordecai had exposed the plot of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the eunuchs who guarded the door to the king's private quarters. They plotted to assassinate King Xerxes. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. And his attendants replied, nothing has been done for him. Who's that in the outer courtyard, the king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole he had prepared. And then verse 5 goes on to say, Haman's out in the courtyard, and the king says, bring him in. So let's, let's talk about the sleeplessness of Xerxes. Why is the king sleepless this night? Is he worried about Esther? What is she going to ask him? What does she want? Maybe it was Haman's construction crew that's building that 75-foot pole that woke him up. Did the Lord wake him? Maybe all three? In the Hebrew, it says, the sleep of the king fled. In the Greek translation of Esther, the Septuagint, it says, the Lord removed the sleep from the king. So the Jewish people knew who woke the king up that night. You can see God's providence even in the king's insomnia. So the king lay awake all night until suddenly it dawned on him he forgot to honor Mordecai. You had to honor the people who protected you because that was that was how you kept your life safe because everybody's trying to kill you in the palace, so he knows he has to do something to honor Mordecai. Verse one says that night he had trouble sleeping. That night, what night? Well, it's the night before Haman comes to hang Mordecai. As it happened, that's an interesting phrase. There's a lot of happenings here. As it happened, the king couldn't sleep. As it happened, he asked for the records. As it happens, he finds the record 
of how Mordecai saved his life. When was that? Five years ago. Five years ago. As it happened, he discovered nothing was done to recognize him. As it happened, there's Haman, the first one there to see the king. Is this all a coincidence? Yogi Berra said, it's too coincidental to be a coincidence. (laughs) This week I was thinking about Ethan and his upcoming sabbatical, so I checked my record books. I have annual diaries that go back 10 years. And uh, so I looked up, I, I looked up when I, when I called Ethan and, and uh, what he was doing. At the time, he was doing carpentry, as I said, in Wisconsin, and he told me he was sleeping on a short love seat. I remember that. And as it happened, someone at Living Rock recommended him to me, and as it happened, we interviewed Ethan in December 2000. 16, and as it happened, he got engaged the night before to Mariah. Lots of happenings, and then we we brought him on January 3rd, 2017, as an intern, and then later on, full-time as a pastor. There was a chain of events that brought Ethan here, and it was more than a coincidence. I think we would say it was a major turning point for him. And for us. So likewise, as it happened, you have this sleepless night in Susa. And it started a chain of events that became a major turning point in the whole story of Esther. As it happens, God sometimes disguises major turning points in our lives too. With a little insomnia with a little event that seems so insignificant, but things are about to turn. So let's see what happens next. Verse 6, So Haman came in, and the king said, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? (laughs) Haman thought to himself, Who would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, now listen now, this is what Haman wants. This is the honor he wants. This is his designer honor right here. If the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with a royal emblem on its head. No, not just any horse, but make sure that horse has that really cool crown on its head and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse and have the official shout as they go this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor This is what the king does to someone he wishes to honor. I'll stop. (laughs) Verse 10. Excellent, the king said to Haman. Quick, take the robes of my horse and do just as you said for Mordecai the Jew. For Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the gate of the palace. Leave out nothing you've suggested. So Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai placing him on the king's own horse and led him through the city square shouting, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. This is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the palace gate. So I have a a picture of this. I found a an artist rendition, The Triumph of Mordecai by Peter Lastman. I don't know if that's how you say it, 1624. I love biblical portraits, and this one, is, this one is good. So there's Mordecai high up on the horse. He, he's looking down at the ground. I don't think he wants to be up there. <laughs> and he's not, 
Look at Haman over there. Boy, if looks could kill. <laughs> and they, they're not looking at each other, I noticed. I think Mordecai just rained on his parade. Can we say that? Oh, how funny is that? And remember in chapter 4 of Esther, Mordecai was wearing, wearing ashes on his head. He had burlap on. Yeah, it was like five minutes ago. He's dramatizing the king's decree to massacre the Jewish people. Now there he is, Mordecai, high up on the king's horse. What does this dramatize? It dramatizes a king's coronation for him. Riding the king's horse, that's a symbol of victory. Wearing the king's robes, that, that's a symbol of nobility, of favor. And Mordecai is given praise and honor from the man who's going to hang him that morning as he shouts to the crowd. This is one of the most ironic and comical scenes in the Bible. Notice Mordecai never says a word. He doesn't speak. He's probably never been on a horse before. Get me down. <laughs> and verse 12 just says he goes back to the gate. He's probably so relieved to be, have his feet back, back on the ground. What a scene. Let's see what happens next. But Haman hurried home dejected and completely humiliate, humiliated when, when Haman told his wife Suresh and all his friends what had happened, his, his wise advisors and his wife said, since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. And while they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. Oh, boy. So here you see the humiliation of Haman. It's, it's a really a case study in poetic justice. Have you heard that term, poetic justice? We usually say what goes around comes around. Poetic justice is this idea that rewarding virtue and punishing vice in an especially appropriate or ironic manner. That's what's happening here. Because remember, that morning, Haman's plan was to publicly hang Mordecai on a 75-foot pole. I called it overkill last week. Okay? He wants everyone to see. He wants to make an example out of Mordecai for dishonoring him. Well, Xerxes' plan, the king's plan, which is really God's plan, was to do the opposite, to, to publicly recognize Mordecai for saving his life, to make an example of Mordecai for all the people to see as one in whom the king delights. It's just a complete and total reversal. God doesn't just do justice, but poetic justice. Haman's great pride is brought low in a great humiliation, and his wife and his friends, they know it's fatal. In strong language, they tell Haman, he will not prevail against the Jews. In Lydia Brownback, in her book, she said, they realize what Haman can't yet see. God's people, the Jews, seem to be protected by a hidden yet powerful hand. And they were. They were protected by a powerful promise. God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you and... Curse those who curse you. So while Haman's rushing off to feast with the king and queen, he'll soon know that God has brought a curse on him for treating the Jewish people with contempt. 
And that's the end of chapter 6. So let me give three applications to this humorous, memorable chapter. First, God never forgets our worship and our work for him. He never forgets. He's not like a forgetful king who, forget, who forgets what we've done for him. It had been five years since Mordecai and Esther saved the king's life. There was no reward, no recognition. In fact, things only got worse. So is God unjust? Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. I think most Christians are a lot like Mordecai. They'd rather be down on the ground. They don't need to be recognized high up on someone's horse. I call them old souls, saints, salt of the earth type believers. They don't care if they're recognized. Their reward is just to know Christ and to love him and serve him. That's, that's our reward. But some days we wonder if God is looking, if God is remembering, if God has forgotten us and all we're doing for him. Some days we wonder, don't we? Is he really there? Is it really worth it? God never forgets. Our worship and our labor for the Lord is not in vain. It's always rewarded every time in his time. The second thing we see in this chapter is that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I mean, James 4, 6, I mean, that's illustrated in this story. And Haman is a case study in pride. If, if you want to know what pride is, just read all about Haman. In the previous chapter, he's boasting about how he has everything, but pride says it's not enough. He wants the Jewish people annihilated, beginning with Mordecai, and, and we learn in this chapter, he also wants to be king. He's designed this parade for Mordecai, which he thought was going to be for him. So he conceives of this honor of wearing the king's robes and riding the king's horse. And no doubt he has in mind, he wants the king's throne too. Pride is essentially competitive. And pride is not happy till you're at the top. The proud must have one thing. They must exalt themselves above everyone else. Jesus warned us in Matthew 23, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's exactly what happens in this chapter. I think the best thing I've ever read on pride is in C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Let me just read a section to you about what he says about the great sin. He said, if I'm a proud man, then as long as there's one man in the whole world more powerful or richer, or cleverer than I, he is my rival and my enemy. <laughs> the Christians are right. It's pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in every family, since the world began. Other vices may sometimes bring people together. You may find good fellowship and jokes and friendship among drunken people, or even unchaste people, but pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. <laughs> and unless you know God as, as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, 
You cannot see something that is above you. I, I have never read anything outside the Bible that convinces me and convicts me more of my pride. And then someone's sitting here going, boy, I wish so-and-so would be here to hear this. <laughs> That's pride too. <laughs> So finally, God's insignificant nudges, like a little touch of insomnia, what's that? God's insignificant nudges lead to significant turning points. Sometimes God works miracles. I I believe he parted the Red Sea. I believe the miracles in the Bible are true. Other times he nudges. He jogs our memory. He wakes us up at night. Maybe it's a text, a phone call, a verse, a song, a a conversation. Maybe it's a pain. He knows how to get your attention. He nudges. The Spirit of God nudges you just at the right time to turn things around. God knows how to how to use these little links and put them together in a long chain of events to turn a life around and bring, bring people back to him. I've, your story of how you came to know Jesus, I bet has a long chain of events. When you turn back to Christ, when you knew you needed God again, I, I bet there's several links in that chain that brought you back to Christ. Am I right? Romans 13, 11, wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. How's that for a nudge? Karen Jobes, who wrote a commentary on Esther, she said, our God is so great, so wonderful, so powerful, that he can work without miracles through ordinary events of billions of human lives through millennia of time to accomplish his eternal purposes and ancient promises. God delivered an entire race of people in Persia because the king had a sleepless night. And I'll show you next Sunday how this sleepless night in Susa turned the whole story of Esther around. Everything will be reversed. All the curses will be reversed from this point on in the story. So I think it's good for us to remember God sometimes works through these little nudges. Sometimes that little nudge can just be some pizza you had the night before, so... Don't be too introspective. But sometimes that nudge is from the Spirit of God. It's important to listen and to move and to respond. We're going to have a feast here in four weeks. And I'm going to start asking you to send me your nudge. Send me a little testimony. Send me a paragraph. Email it to me. Text it to me of how God got your attention how he used an event in your life to get your attention and you didn't think it was that big of a deal but it turned out to be a pretty big deal. If you could send me that, that would be fun. I've heard some stories in this congregation that I would like to tell but I can't without your permission. (laughs) But I know God has done some really amazing things through what seemed to be a simple nudge. And things turned around. So please think about sending that to me and let me share that with the congregation at our, at our Thanksgiving feast. The question is, how is God nudging you today? And are you awake today to his providence, to his love, and to his leading in your life? Amen? Let's pray. 
Oh, this was fun, Lord. This was fun to read this story and see how you work with your people and how you bring down the proud. And that's a little scary, but it's a little encouraging to know you bring down the proud. And so, Lord, I I pray you would humble us and drive that pride out of our lives. And thank you as we see we live in this world of worldly pride all around us. Thank you that you are God. And there's no one higher than you. And you know how to bring the proud around or bring them down and humble them. Every knee, the scripture says, will bow to Jesus Christ. And every tongue will confess he is Lord. Because you alone are God. Thank you, God. I invite you to lead and to nudge and to work in our lives this week and bring what you want to bring about into our lives. Help us to be careful to follow you and respond to your provident ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing before we go.